was like the algorithm of how to deal with the ECG. What was the first step we do when we have an ECG in front of us? What was the first step? So yeah, you look at the, the AVR, you look at the AVR and you make sure that the P wave, QRS complex and T wave, all of them are facing down. If they are facing up, it means that the patient, you, you have put in the ECG machine wrongly, basically. You, you did not put it correctly. So the P wave, QRS complex and the T wave should be facing down. The next step is to look at the P wave, yeah? When, where do we look at the B wave? Which lead do we use as beginner? Okay, good, lead two. So you go to lead two, search for a B wave. Here is a B wave. Okay, it looks normal. There is a B wave preceding every QRS complex. It's okay. What is my next step? After I check the B wave, okay, I look at the QRS complex. QRS complex is supposed to be less than three small boxes, which means 120 milliseconds. Well, this one looked like less than 120 boxes. If it is less than 120, it means what? Yeah, it's atrial. And if it's more than 120, what does it mean? Ventricular. Good. So the next step, okay, we check the QRS complex. What's next? What are we supposed to do next? Okay, so starting with the intervals. So we check the BR interval. Keep in mind that when we have the word interval, it means that it contains a wave. When, when it's a segment, it does not contain a wave. So if the BR interval was a prolonged, what does that mean? AV block, excellent. So if the BR interval was long, it means it's an AV block. If it was short, it brought, oh, okay. So if it was really, really, really short, well, Parkinson White syndrome, excellent. Okay, so next step, we check the BR interval. What, what should we check next? QT interval. If the QT interval was prolonged, uh, that kind of predispose you to have what? Torsa de Bois, and it's due to Chanelopathy. Okay, so, um, okay, you check the QT interval. Can somebody tell me uh, until which length we consider it to be normal, and when do we consider it to be pathological? W what is the cutoff between normal and pathological for the QT interval. Like the QRS complex, we said it's a three small boxes, for example. What about this one, the QT interval? Is it like how many big boxes, let's say? It's more than one big. Remember, QT interval contain your, first of all, um, it contains your uh, QRS complex, it contains your T wave, it contains a lot of stuff. So it must be really, really long. It can be up to 400 to 440, 400 to 440 uh, millisecond. 400 to 440 millisecond is approximately how many big boxes? Okay, please keep in mind that, as, yes, more than two. Why? Because one big box is 200. So, if I'm telling you that one big box is 200, one small box inside of it, it's like 40. So, this big box is 400. One small box inside of it, 
I'm, I'm sorry, this is 200 and one small box inside of it will be 40. So you tell me guys, how many small boxes I can fit inside of a big box? Five, yes. So um, I told you that the QT can be as long as like the, the longest it can be like 400 until 440. So that is equivalent to two big boxes and a little bit. So, and if we consider like only small boxes, it will be like if we consider here is five and here is five and here is one because like one is like 40. So up to 11 small boxes, it's okay. Anything more than 11 small boxes is considered acute interval prolongation that can be predisposed to de bois. Okay, so what is your, your next step after you check the QT interval? What do you check next? The T wave. Okay, um, so let's say the T wave was uh, prominent with someone complaining of chest pain. His, his ST segment, though, this person is normal. Uh, sorry, his ST segment is normal. He only have like a really prominent T wave. What does that mean? It's an acute MI. It's so acute that the ST segment have not like uh, become elevated yet. Okay, so let's say that the T wave is a flat. What does the T wave, uh, when the T wave is a flat, what does that mean? Hypokalemia. And in case of hypokalemia, which additional wave are you going to see? U wave. Okay. So, that was just an initial um, introduction to what we uh, to all of these ACGs we are going to speak about today. So let's play this game, shall we? Let's go. So this person, um, you cannot see the QRS, nothing like that. I'm just going to give you the history, and you have to solve the question. This patient came to you to the emergency department complaining of chest pain. His chest pain has started six hours ago, and he is cursing at you because you are not helping him. So can somebody tell me which area inside of his heart is affected? A. Is it a transmural MI? B. Is it a subendocardial MI? C. It just um, neither of these two. Remember, so transmural somebody wrote. Excellent. It's transmural. Why do we said? Uh, why have we said it's a transmural? Look, if you check here, if you like enlarge on this, exactly ST segment elevation. So if you take here the end of S, and if I make a line here, make a line. If you compare it to the BR interval, it's like ooh, it's just a huge distance between the two. That tells you that the ST segment is actually elevated. And it's not only in this lead. If you take a look at the other lead here, it's also elevated. So you are like, wait, 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 I cannot see it. So here it is. This is the S wave, like the end of the S wave. What do we call the end of the S wave, by the way, guys? It has a name. Yes, 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 yes. It's called the J point. So that J point, um, you, you draw a line from there. And you can see after that, after you have drawn the line, this is the ST segment, and it's much higher than the BR segment. This is an ST segment elevation, myocardial infarction. There, this is a transmural MI. Guys, what is the, uh, what you will give the patient for the pain in this case? For the pain. Morphine. Okay, um, what else do you give this, these patients? There's a few drugs you have to give them. What else do you give? He just came to you with an MI. What should I do with him? Okay, you give nitrates. What else? Aspirin. Okay, what else? Heparin, what else? Oxygen, excellent. Remember, the oxygen, when we give it, we give it to reduce the pain. ACE inhibitor, excellent. We can give it uh, uh, later 
Uh, but keep in mind actually guys about the oxygen it's one uh, it's not an initial therapy but like it helps the patient feel better it does not change the mortality actually like some of these guys do not change the mortality for example if we speak about the oxygen the morphine they do not play any role in the mortality uh, but they just make the patient feel better beta blocker as well and statin excellent everybody okay so let's speak about the next one so here let's start with this so first step checking the AVR everything is facing down excellent so we have put in net correctly let's take a look at the B wave does it exist yep you can see a B wave yeah what is the next step after checking the B wave checking the QRS complex well it looks really long but I cannot say that it, it looks pathological too much well here it is take a look it's widened apparently but not that bad okay let me just delete this one or no maybe you guys want the file okay so come on so you can take a look here and you can see what the QRS is wide yes because it's more than three small boxes so after I check the QRS what is my next step yeah the BR interval is quite short here and uh, if that is the case that tells us about switch disease okay excellent guys this is well parkinson white syndrome i hope you can appreciate the delta wave here which represents the pre-excitation of the ventricle why there is a pre-excitation of the ventricle what leads to this The bundle of Kent. Yes, the bundle of Kent. Awesome, everybody. So that, see, you diagnose with Parkinson White syndrome, super easy, not a big deal. You diagnosed an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, not a big of a deal. Okay, let's speak about next one. Oh, you already saw. Can, yes, of course I can. Just a second. Okay, look at the distance between the B wave and the QRS complex. It's, it's ridiculous. If you look, there is like this wave that is starting too early, yeah? And it's sliding up. And yeah, you can see it also here. You can see it also here. So this sliding up motion, we call this a delta wave. We, you, can look, you can practically see it in every single uh, uh, lead. So it's not like in, in just the second lead. If you look at this lead, for example, lead V3, for example, you also can appreciate it here. See? Pre-excitation this atrial uh, there is an atrial enlargement let's take a look atrial enlargement oh man well my question to you is there a ventricular enlargement is there a ventricular enlargement in this patient well this is like not for the US MLE, this is just for you guys. When you take a look at the ECG, just look at the R wave. If you see the R wave, uh, if you take a look here, it's more prominent at the lateral wall. So what makes you the lateral wall of your heart? Is it the left ventricle or the right ventricle? Left ventricle. And the R wave is ridiculously high. Yeah? So since it's ridiculously high, the R wave in the lateral leads, so you start thinking about left ventricular hypertrophy. So yeah, keep that in mind. So also, uh, yeah, there is this, uh, uh, like some indexes you can calculate, there is many things you can do. And there is also a way in which you can, oh yeah, there is a prominent T wave here as well. You can appreciate it here, guys. I have to say, this exact patient, when I bring the case, uh, he actually had two pathology. They wrote about Wolf Parkinson White syndrome and the fact that he has an acute MI, but it's super acute that is only presenting with one thing only, a T wave, like uh, a prominent T wave. Uh, why I brought you this case so you can see and appreciate the fact that you can have one ECG two conditions So this patient have Wilk Parkinson White syndrome in addition to what? a Prominent T wave which tell you about what acute MI so he has two in one Okay, next case 
This one is normal. I just like use it in the beginning to show you each lead and where it is exist. By the way, the BR interval, just for the sake of completeness, because I discovered a lot of you don't know what is the norm. I hope someone would write all of them. BR interval, it's a three small boxes, which is like 120 millisecond up to 200 millisecond, like three small boxes up to uh, five small boxes. This is norm. Anything more than that, we consider it a prolongation. Okay, next thing. Let's take a look at this one. Well, like always, let's do the algorithm. Um, we start with what? The first thing we start at is checking the lead AVR. Everything is facing down, good. Let's search for the B wave. B wave, B wave. Here it is, B wave. You can see it. Sometimes if you find it difficult to see it in the lead number two, go to another, uh, go to a nearby lead, go to lead number one. So you can see it here, B wave. Okay, excellent. Well, what about ch after checking the B wave, what do I check? Okay, there is a wide in the QRS complex, excellent. After the QRS complex, what do I do? Just a second, this thing keeps like going around. Uh, just take it here. Okay, yeah, that's better. Okay, you check the BR interval. The BR interval here, it looks kind of norm. So let's see, oh yeah, it's, it might be like five boxes. It's not, it's not ridiculously enlarged. Like, let's see, like one, two, three, four and a half. Mildly prolonged, but it's not the main pathology. But we cannot say it's a prolonged until, if, uh, until it be more than five small boxes. Okay, what after the BR interval, what do we check? After, uh, just let, let's follow the algorithm, the QT, okay. The QT interval here, you can see, uh, well, to make it simple for you, because I did this already, I counted everything, it's normal. So, after the QT, what do you have to check? The T, yeah? Good. So, if you look at the T of this patient, it's a little bit delayed, as you can see, yeah? So, you are like, okay, but the, then the ST segment, you can see somewhere it's a little bit elevated, somewhere it's a little bit depressed, but that's not the main thing. So, this one was is a little bit confusing, but... I want you to be comfortable with one thing. Can you see this little notch at the lead number one? There is a little notch at the QRS complex, like dentation of the, yeah. Okay, so you are thinking about a bundle branch block. Let's look at V1. Well, does the V1 have the bunny ears? No, it does not have the bunny ears, no bunny ears at lead one. Okay, so does lead V6 have the bunny ears? Yes, it has the bunny ears. So what is it? Left bundle branch block. To confirm a left bundle branch block, you know how I do my classes with you guys. Every day I add something new. So left bundle branch block, you have the bunny ears. If you want to confirm it, because now I see that you can diagnose it, you go to lead one. Um, you know this, uh, like, uh, uh, like, we call it the beard sign. Uh, be, uh, I will show you. Beard sign. Beard, beard sign. Like, if you like, uh, take a look at the, like, a be, uh, beard nose, and if he is putting his, uh, his nose here, you can see, like, this shape. Yeah? So, when you see this, this is highly uh, this make you highly suspect the left bundle branch block. So, you first of all take a look at this double, uh, uh, like the bunny ear sign, and then you take a look. Uh, you take a look at V1 to confirm it. Okay, bunny, bird, bunny, bird. To make it interesting enough, in the right bundle branch block, it's exactly the opposite. The bird will be here. The bunny will be there. Okay. So, guys, uh, for the new members that does not know what is bunny, uh, bunny, it's like bunny ears, something like this. Good. So, when do we have the crackles? Crackles will be, in any case, leading to the left heart, uh, like, um, 
increase the preload like if someone has a mitral regurg it can have it in left bundle branch block you can have it in left heart failure you can have it anything that is leading to pulmonary edema basically so let's uh, go back to our file okay correct so if you take a look at this next one you can see all perfecto so what is the problem here? You can follow the algorithm from uh, the first step. Okay, all good. Next step is checking the B wave. Wait a second, where is the B wave? You are hiding the B wave. There's something, not a B wave here. And there is something like a fluttering. What is this? Fibrillating, sorry, not a fluttering. Uh, because fibr uh, so actually, the, oh yeah, I remember this case. So here's the thing, for some, I did not even know about this personally. A patient can have a flutter and fibrillation at the same time. If he has an ectopic fossa activated in the left atrium and an ectopic fossa activated in the right atrium. So as you can see in this lead, the patient has no B wave. So this is suspected of AFib. In the same time, if you look at V1, you can so, uh, see the, this so wave appearance. So this so wave appearance, it's an A flutter, exactly. So the patient has both an AFib and an A flutter. Good. Okay, so that I just wanted to warm you up guys with these ECGs. I, if you like it, I will be doing this uh, much more often to get you more comfortable with ECGs because after all, uh, all of you are going to get at least four ECGs on your test on step one and again on step two you will get like five or six of them so the earliest you master it the better it is okay let's go let's go let's go so yesterday we were speaking about ischemic heart disease we discussed it we discussed a lot of complication of it we discussed about various way we are looking at the heart as well we discussed about the enzymes and uh, I forgot to tell you, oh, no, I told you. So remember guys, troponin is awesome, but it's bad for reinfarction checking. While the CKMB uh, is perfect for uh, checking for reinfarction. And by the way, guys, can you tell me please, just, just like a quick fact. If I stop supplying the heart with blood, how long it takes until the heart becomes stunned and stop contracting? After the NMI, how long it takes the heart to stop contracting? Well, some people say 30 minutes, some people say 6 hours, some people say few minutes, some say 20 minutes. So, it's quite various. Guys, there is two processes. The process of necrosis almost sta start like after like not a long period of time. But the stunning of the heart happens almost immediately, like within five minutes. So what is the stunning of the heart? When you occlude the blood supply to the heart, the heart tries to protect himself by stopping the contraction. And when he stops the contraction, he just enter a process of hybridination. That makes him not contracting. And that makes him uh, be like at less chance of uh, oxygen demand. Yeah. And thus, uh, well, there is less consumption of O2 and there is no exacerbation of the infarction. Be careful when you re reperfuse somebody because of the uh, reperfusion injury, which is mediated by what? What the reperfusion in injury mediated by? Free radicals, exactly. Good. Okay, next thing we are going to speak about today is dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, what cardiomyopathy is in general? So I need you guys to be a little bit wake up uh, today because we are going to speak about different types of cardiomyopathy, uh, heart failure. We are going to speak uh, about all the types of heart failure and shock. Also, we will speak about bacterial endocarditis. So yeah this these topics are quite important and there is no jokes with these guys so let's be um, alert and be ready 
for the explanation and the questions. So, dilated cardiomyopathies. My first question for you guys. Um, what is the difference uh, in case of dilated cardiomyopathies? Will you have it in a Rieger's murmur or in a stenosis murmur? Yes, it will be in a Rieger's murmur, never in a stenosis murmur. Good. So, yeah, basically anything that increases the amount of the blood inside of the heart ridiculously. It's the most common cardiomyopathies, 90% of the cases, often idiopathic, which means we have no idea what causes it, or familial. So the familial one, it's due to a mutation of the TTN gene. Guys, I had a student who had exactly this question, so please know about the Titan, okay? So Titan encodes for one proteins inside of the sarcomere. Sarcomere of what? Of the muscle of the heart. So if that titan, which like it's a binding protein, is absent, the whole structure of the heart will not be held uh, in the place. And that leads to what? Dilated cardiomyopathy. It's just the, the titan, to make it simple, this is the sarcomere of the heart, guys, okay? So it, it has like different particles. It has like the thick filament, thin filament, all of this stuff. And the titan comes like kind of in the middle. Just a second, I will show it to you. I'm searching for a good pick. Come on. Actin, myosin, no, there is the Titan, just a sec. Not the movie. Yes, this one. Can you see the Titan, guys? We'll send it on the group. Because they do ask about this. So the Titan is located just right here. And that Titan, it, without him, you can see there will be no holding of the muscle into its place. So that will lead to dilated cardiomyopathy, okay? So you are uh, you are basically not holding the muscle in its place. So if you are not holding it in its place, you will be able to dilate the heart tissue much more. Okay, so the next thing we have is, let's go to, yes, okay. So other etiologies included drugs, like what? Alcohol, yeah, so you are telling me that alcoholics get dilated cardiomyopathy due to the ethanol. By the way, guys, um, the drinkable alcohol, is it ethanol or methanol? It's important to differentiate. Is it E or N? Okay, it's ethanol. Why I'm telling you this, guys? Because there is a three types of alcohol you must know for the U.S. assembly. There is ethanol, there is methanol, and there is ethanol, ethanol, glycol. Okay? So three types. So ethanol, it's like what? It's like vodka. Well, yeah, it's like uh, all of these uh, um, drinks, alcoholic beverages. Is it bad? Yeah, it's horrible for your body, but that's not our topic. What about methanol? Well, methanol is mostly in antiseptics, okay? Like this uh, stuff you clean your hand with. And, uh, well, can someone drink it? Well, yeah, if he's an alcoholic and he really want to get high, well, get it drunk. He will drink anything. Why methanol is dangerous if you drink it? What it can lead to? Something that you must know for the USMLEs. Well, drinking methanol can lead to blindness, can to lead to a blindness. It can like lead to retinopathy and the blindness. So if you get a question about a drunk homeless guy and then they tell you he cannot see suddenly, think about methanol. So there is an antidote for uh, methanol. Well, if you, if you have money, you can use uh, fumobizol, which is like a drug, an actual drug. But if you don't have the money, you can bring vodka. Well, yeah, because uh, the ethanol is an antidote for the methanol. Why? Because both of them work on the same initial enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase. Okay, so what about, uh, so you told, I told you guys that this methanol is found in the antiseptic and it can lead to retinopathy. What about ethanylglycol? Ethanylglycol, it's the antifreeze. 
you are like what is an antifreeze well um if he kneel so what is the antifreeze for cars guys so these cars um they they can need something called the antifreeze it's like a form of water you put it inside of the car and it keeps it uh, the engine from like freezing it during like winter as you can see it is like a bluish it has a sweet smell into it and uh, well alcoholics love it so when they drink this guy look how delicious that is uh, what it can lead to so we said ethanol can lead you to acerosis perfecto uh, methanol can lead to retinopathy and the blindness uh, no 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 this is just a ferma name do not look at here so this is ethanyl glycol we call it the antifreeze this one is is minato, uh, methanol ethanol ethanyl glycol the ethanyl glycol is the antifreeze the antifreeze uh, is a, uh, it's a blue it smells sweet so some people drink it children and alcoholic if that is the case you must know that it can lead to one kidney stones okay it can lead to kidney stones two it can lead to acute tubular necrosis so it's no joke so ethanyl glycol can lead to kidney problem methanol eye problem ethanol liver problem i hope it makes sense so keep in mind that chronic consumption of alcohol which is ethanol can lead to uh, dilated cardiomyopathies also cocaine as well well cocaine works as a vasoconstrictor okay guys so it vasoconstricts everything including the vessel going going inside of your heart inclu including the vessels inside of your mouth so if you take a look at this guy who consumed like uh, cocaine for a really long time look at the top of his mouth it's not there what happened they like to show you this picture and ask you about the mechanism the mechanism is vasoconstriction chronic vasoconstriction has reduced the blood supply to his palate which eventually lead, led to it being like a broken down until it just simply disappeared yep exactly oh, I, I, I agree I agree so yeah don't do uh, drugs boys so the next thing uh, doxorubicin doxorubicin is an anti-cancer drug okay and it can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy but it's reversible if you utilize uh, an antidote for that you must know how does doxorubicin lead to the dilated cardiomyopathies it's a free radical injury please write a note about that so doxorubicin it's due to free radical injury alcohol cholesterol degeneration and degeneration of the cell membrane cocaine vasoconstriction of the small vessels okay now the infections some infections can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy like Coxsackie B virus Coxsackie B virus can someone tell me which group of viruses is it it is I you did not do micro yet so if you don't get it it's okay I will count to three one two and three okay exactly it's an enterovirus for the one who read e you are correct so enteroviruses have like the following types bolio virus is an enterovirus coxsackie virus is an enterovirus and echo virus is an enterovirus you must know why we call them entero entero relates to the small intestine so all of these can be digested so the infection of polio, coxsackie, and echovirus are all due to ingestion. What does that mean? That means that the protection of them is mediated by IgA. Why IgA? Why not IgG or IgM? Well, this is more deeply when we will discuss immunology, but I will tell you that the only secretory Ig, uh, immunoglobulin, will be IgA. And he is the one located in your GIT. So you can think which patient will be at high risk of getting this infection? Someone with a deficiency of IgA. Yeah? And we'll speak who, who that is in the future. So, also something called Chagos disease. 
Chagas disease is a really interesting disease. This poor patient, um, it's mostly in Latin America and um, it's, it's due to a bug actually. So this bug will bite you and that bite will transmit um, like a little protozoa inside of you. And yes, exactly. See, see this uh, bug guys, they call it the kissing box. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Why do we call it the kissing bug? First of all, I want you to imagine this scenario. You are laying and you are sleeping. See this big bug? It comes to you during the night, give you a kiss in your mouth. I'm not, I'm not kidding. It does do that. And after it does this, it bites you like near your lips, but from the inner portion, that's the kiss, kissing bug. And then it puts a tribunosema inside of you, which is basically a protozoa. The protozoa goes inside of your GIT and starts its life cycle. Eventually, it can lead to some problems and uh, 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 for example, one of the many problems they have include one, they can have uh, well, big esophagus, esophageomegaly, uh, also big rectum, megacolon, also they can have what? Dilated cardiomyopathy. Yep. So that's all about Chagos. They can have also angioedema. Look at this lady. Yep. So it's a pretty serious disease. Okay, the next cause, um, it goes something like this. Uh, we have ischemia, uh, can lead to it, like um, uh, in case of coronary artery disease. Uh, in addition to systemic condition, hemochromatosis, uh, sarcoidosis, thyrotoxicosis, and wet very very. I believe that all of you deserve to get explanation why the hell does conditions like this can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy. In case of hemochromatosis, guys, what is Fenton reaction? Does anybody of you know what is Fenton reaction? Fenton reaction, it's from iron, we get what? free radicals okay so from hemochro in hemochromatosis you can get um, um, like free radicals and uh, these free radicals will lead to that form of injury a really high yield thing to know is the relationship with it with thyrotoxicosis why thyrotoxicosis is related to this condition it does not make sense well thyrotoxicosis does it lead to tachycardia or bradycardia tachycardia yeah because it uh, like lead to overstimulation of which receptor okay well it's beta 1 receptor yeah and then uh, when the beta 1 receptor is hyperactive the heart work 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 so we have an increased cardiac output heart failure because the heart is just cannot handle it well, we can contrast this high output heart failure, exactly. We can contrast this with wet periberi, which is also high output heart failure, but the mechanism is a little bit different. I have one student in this group who actually asked me about this. I had to look it up for a couple of hours just to find the exact answer because the resources do not have the exact same idea about this. So some resources said that wet periberi uh, the uh, yeah, that was one resource. Uh, Ambos said something else. You word said something else. So I'm going just to tell you what I have found out. If we speak about uh, wet periberi, the idea was uh, like this. So they said there is degeneration of the cardiac tissue due to the decrease of the B1, which lead to a decrease in the protein synthesis, and that can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy. That was source one. The ne next source said it was NCBI. So the first source was AMBOS. Second source was... Uh, um, <laughs> the second source was... Said something like this uh, regarding the mechanism. They said, in case of B1 deficiency, there will be massive vasodilatation of the small vessels inside of your body, which lead to your heart working over time, leading to dilated cardiomyopathy. The third resource said something about people who are having wet beriberi, 
are highly likely to be alcoholic as well. And thus, they can get dilated cardiomyopathy. I have to say, every time there is contraindication between resources for the USMLE, they cannot ask you that question. It just like makes sense. They cannot ask you a question where there is people contraindicating each other. So if one question has the three answers, don't worry about it. It will not be asked. What is important to know? There is what is important to know is the difference between wet beriberi and dry beriberi. A dry beriberi, the patient suffers from neuropathy. It, it suffers from neuropathy. While wet beriberi, they suffer from what? The patient with um, wet beriberi suffer not from uh, neuropathy but mainly heart failure. Thus, they get the edema. Thus, this is why we call it wet. Okay, so the next thing here we have as follow. Uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy, why do you think a pregnant lady is high risk of this? Why a pregnant lady will have a dilated cardiomyopathy, why do you think? Hypervolemia, exactly, she has a blood for two. So. Um, and uh, you can imagine if she has like hypervolemia, the end diastolic volume will be much higher. Yeah, and that will distend the heart walls. So the findings in such patient, the first thing obviously it's heart failure. When we tell you cardiomyopathy, it must be heart failure. And SC3, can someone tell me what is the definition of SC3? Come on, do not give me disappointment, it's not hypertrophy. Okay, again, let's explain that topic again. So, uh huh. So, if we speak about the S's, we have S1, S2, S3, and S4. If the patient is suffering from the stiffness of the ventricle, making the wall much more thick and thus much more stiff this will give you an s4 okay this example of this is like in case of hypertension okay leading to left ventricular hypertrophy while in cases of dilated cardiomyopathies and anything leading to dilatation of the left ventricle um, that will be in case of dilated if it's dilated, it's basically the water is just is being pushed against an empty ventricle. Yeah. So yeah, there is a blood here, but there is a small area that is empty. So when the blood pushes inside of it, it will be like giving this sound. So that's in the SA3. So it's like Rabbit, exactly, rabbit blood flow against a thin ventricle, not a thick ventricle. Okay, guys, if you forget, just draw a three. Look at the three. It looks like a dilated heart. So, it's dilated something, dilated bu bucket. Just think about it, use your imagination, and you can get it correct. Okay, so the next thing, we have findings we have heart failure, S3, systolic regurgitant murmur. So, can some of you tell me what examples of systolic regurgitant murmur? Systolic murmur? Regurgitant? Yep, awesome, good. So, the next thing uh, we have is dilated heart on an echocardiogram will be seen. And uh, well, how does a dilated heart look? It looks big. So if you take a look here at this picture, normally your heart is supposed like the, the heart apex should be at the fifth intercostal space, two and a half centimeter right to the mediclavicular line. But here it's left to the mediclavicular line. If it's left to the mediclavicular line, it tells you what? It tells you that the patient is suffering from cardiomegaly. So, yeah, that's the idea. The patient has cardiomegaly. So, balloon appearance of the heart on chest x-ray. Um, yeah, you can see here is the balloon. Huh. 
<laughs> exactly. So look, um, um, look, you must uh, most of the time no, you should you should just like be comfortable. Um, if this is step one. This is not the clinical stuff. So uh, you just need to be comfortable of looking at the clavicle, making a line, and if it's going to the left of the line, done. That's a dilated cardio. That's a big heart. If it is right to the line, this is a normal heart. They don't like, like to make it much more complicated than it is. Just a step one. Remember, to solve this question, you only have one and a half minute. You don't have time for indexes and stuff like that. So they will literally tell you it's bigger or they will show it to you. So the next thing we have here is the treatment of dilated cardiomyopathy. What is the treatment? Sodium restriction. Why? Less sodium, less water. Less water, less preload. Less preload, less dilated cardiomyopathy. ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitor decrease your afterload and decrease your preload. Decreasing the preload, perfecto. What about the, the afterload? When you decrease the afterload, you increase the contractility of the heart. Yeah? And thus, uh, the ACE inhibitors are perfect. Beta blockers, you're like, wait, 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 wait. Why would I give a beta blocker to somebody hard that is just like suffering, you know? Well, beta blockers, um, exactly. They decrease the workload in the heart and they decrease the auto consumption by the heart and they help the heart function better. So less contractions, but more effective. Um, diuretics, diuretics decrease your afterload and thus increases your contractility. In addition, diuretics also decrease your preload. Mineral non-corticoid receptor blocker. The same mechanism, but please guys, add this to your book. Uh, spironolactone, a diuretic, it helps in the mortality, not because of its diuretic function. It prevents remodeling of the heart. They want you to know this, that spironolactone and eblerinone it prevent the remodeling of the heart. Okay. Also, digoxin. Digoxin does not improve the mortality, just improve the symptom. And can someone tell me how does digoxin work? Which is inhibited by digoxin? What in, uh, get inhibited by digoxin? Okay. Okay. Okay, so more calcium will be inside of the cell, but what, which bomb? Yes, sodium potassium uh, uh, ATBase is inhibited initially. That eventually lead to more calcium inside of the cell, and thus uh, that leads to more contractility. Okay, ICD, which, uh, which is the defibrillator we spoke about the other day, and the last step will be what? Heart, uh, heart transplant. You don't do it to anybody. Well, okay guys, now I'm going to tell you about this. So, leads to systolic dysfunction. Systolic dysfunction, is it a problem with relaxation or a problem with uh, contraction? Contraction, yes. Diastolic dysfunction, it is a problem with relaxation. So, dilated cardiomyopathy, you can see how thin this is. It's just like... When you take a look at someone at the gym during leg days, really thin, yeah. So dilated cardiomyopathy displays an eccentric hypertrophy. The sarcomeres are in series. What does that mean? Let me show you. There is uh, two forms of hypertrophy. There is the eccentric one. Let me show you. Come on. So yeah, and there is the parallel one exactly. But take a look at this. If you take, uh, this is a normal heart. As you can see, there is like a couple of sarcomeres and that's it. They are located, a couple of them in series and that's it. In parallel and that's it. See? But what happens if you add more in parallel? Not in series, you are not adding more in series. You are just adding more in parallel. You get a concentric hypertrophy. It becomes thick, more thick. If you add more like this, it becomes more thick. This is concentric hypertrophy because you added them in parallel. Well, if you add them on series, uh, it will be what? It will be eccentric. It will be dilated cardiomyopathy. Here you go for the one who requested the picture. So I hope it makes sense. I like this picture actually. 
Okay, so you can see here how uh, it's like they are in series, so one after the other, that makes it dilated. While if you put it in parallel, it you just make the wall thicker. Okay, let's speak about the next one. Okay, so the next disease we are going to speak about is Takotsubu. Um, um, yeah, I saw that one as well, it's good. So, keep in mind that they are located in series, thus this patient will have dilated cardiomyopathy. The next disease I want you to know is Takotsubu cardiomyopathy. Why the name is super weird? Well, Takotsubu basically is a, a, an old uh, a Japanese trap, okay? So that is a trap for what? Which animal? For octopus. Can you see it here on the right? So, what does it mean? What is the trap of octopus? Well, basically, uh, the octopus is here and uh, uh, taco is uh, octopus. Latinos will be offended. Anyway, so you can see this trap and the octopus enter inside of it and he cannot exit. Yeah? Why he cannot exit? Because this, uh, this um, basically, the tsubo, the trapping bot, is quite interesting. It has a characteristic structure of being tight here and more dilated near the apex. So why the he why I'm telling you about this? Because this is exactly what is happening inside of your heart. So if you take a look at this patient's heart, normally your heart is like kind of a triangular shape. But now it's becoming we weird shaped, like it's becoming here um, tight and the then it becomes kind of dilated, you know? So it looks like what? The octopus trap, the takotsubu. So Japanese people have discovered, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, Japanese people like to name their stuff weird stuff like takotsubu, Hashimoto haruidaitas. So yeah, get used to it. So we also call it the broken heart syndrome. It's a ventricular apical ballooning likely due to an increased sympathetic stimulation. What is a sympathetic stimulation? It's by catecholamines. So catecholamines lead to it. And most of the time it's due to a stressful situation that can lead to lead up to it. And that's pretty much it. Okay, now let's take a little break for 10 minutes and come back to uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. See you in 10 guys.